uh, because I'm completely convinced that if you don't have a great culture, then excellence is something you're going to keep chasing, and you're not going to be able to ever get there. Uh, so a lot of people know the name Main Street uh, in association primarily with our development company, because we are the largest developer of skilled nursing in the United States and have been now for several years. But a lot of people don't know that we actually have uh, seven different businesses that we've started out of Main Street. One is Property Group, which is the development company. Another one is an operating company uh, that's created a new product called Rapid Recovery Centers and are now operational in Texas. We'll open up a, one center a month for the next 18 months in several different states. We also have a public company, Main Street Health Investments, the second uh, IPO that we've done publicly. One of those we sold to Welltower. And we also have a student living business, which is growing quite well. And then a private equity shop that actually looks at acquires uh, businesses that we feel will be uh, enhance what we're doing. For instance, we bought a lighting distributor. We bought a door and fireplace manufacturer. A lot of the products that we use in our developments that we think we can enhance those companies as well as utilizing them uh, better in our developments as well. But Main Street's mission is actually none of these things. These actually are, are somewhat incidental to our mission. Our mission is to transform lives. That's what we want to do. We actually want to have a positive impact on society around us and do it through excellent business practice. Unfortunately, we can't do excellent business practice if we don't have a great group of people who are pulling in the same direction. And what I found is that that mission to transform lives is actually both external and internal is that we have every bit the opportunity to have an impact on our people inside the company as we do on those outside the company as we're impacting areas like healthcare operations or student living or others. And so in order to do that, we actually had to seek intentionally to go try to build a great culture. But I've learned a lot of interesting lessons along the way. But first, I want to show a little bit about our culture. When was the last time you went all in? All in with your time, all in with your family and friends, your job, your purpose. Treating each moment of the day as an opportunity to live a fruitful life and help those around you do the same. Main Street believes in going all in at every interaction, at home, at work, and all the places and interactions in between. And that is how we continue to transform the lives of our employees and the people we serve. We're looking for talented, passionate people who are ready to embrace a culture of love, hope, faith, and excellence. And create a workplace that goes all in in everything we do. We don't just develop, fund, and operate the next generation of healthcare properties. Our mission is bigger. We're building one of the nation's fastest growing companies with people that want to be bigger, better, and bolder. With people who are passionate and thoughtful. Together, we're developing the best of the best. Are you ready to join us and go all in? At Main Street, we exist to transform the lives of everyone who walks through the doors of our offices and our properties. We are more than the sum of our parts, because we're all in. That inspires us. Does it inspire you? So in order to talk about culture, though, we have to define it. Culture is one of the most searched for words on the internet. In fact, it was Merriam-Webster's number one word of 2014. It's clearly important to us. And there's a misnomer on this, though, first that we have to go into is that culture cannot be created by leaders. That's actually something that, that's misunderstood. Instead, leaders actually set the stage, what I'll call climate. They set the stage for culture to grow, <clears throat> but it has to be embraced by the people. It has to actually be lived by the people. And if the people don't embrace it, if they're not all in, then you won't have a great culture. So organizational culture is defined as a system of shared assumptions, values, and beliefs which govern how people behave in organizations. These shared values have a strong influence on the people and how they uh, act, dress, and ultimately perform their jobs. Every organization has a culture. It may not know it, it may not recognize it, it may not like it, but it has one, it does exist. And the company's true values are actually shown in who gets rewarded, hired, promoted, and ultimately let go. So why is culture so important? Well, culture is the basis for engagement. It is what moves people from interested to bought in to ultimately all in. And it's what defines how they're going to perform their jobs. 
but our work culture is actually in a state of crisis right now. Over half the businesses uh, in surveys rate culture issues as urgent. It's estimated that nearly two in five employees are actually seriously considering leaving their place of employment. And over th only 31% of people are, are engaged at work. And what's interesting is that 17.5% are considered actively disengaged. That means they're showing up every single day actively disengaging from your business. That's a serious issue. So how do we go and address that? Well, I think there's two different ways. It's, they're kind of like a yin and yang. One is you have to set a great climate. I believe that's on leadership. It's a, a bit like thermostat and a furnace. Thermostat sets the temperature and direction that you think you want to go. Furnace is ultimately what performs that. So climate, what is set by leadership, is the overall set, the environment, if you will, the culture is going to live in. Culture is actually going to be lived and breathed by your people. It also has to be protected and enhanced by your people. This is one of the mistakes that we made. We built a really great culture, and then we would hire people that were interested in being a part of that culture. That makes sense, right? Except it's a mistake, because everyone's interested in being part of a great culture. The question is, do they fit the culture? Or do they enhance the culture? So now we've actually had to make some adjustments in our hiring process to actually make people show us why they already embody the culture, rather than expecting them just to be interested in it. Because what happens is, is you bring somebody in that's interested in a great culture, which should be all of us, after some period of time, six months, a year, two years, who they are starts to come out, and they may not fit at all. Very important lesson learned for us. So climate is defined as a set of properties of the work environment perceived directly or indirectly by the employees that strongly influence their actions and job performance. I believe climate is established and safeguarded by the leadership, but it's affected by many external and internal factors, such as profit and loss, wins and losses, uh, profitability, turnover. Uh, we were just talking about turnover, and we'll get into that a little bit in the panel next. The message for climate actually emanates from the top, but it has to be bought in at every level. If it's not bought in by the people, then the climate will be largely irrelevant. So how do you set a great climate? First of all, there's, you have to set why you do what you do, and secondly, you have to show people how to do it. So you provide clarity with the why. Clarity is this, why do you exist? What's the point of your organization? It should be so defined such that if you could not do that anymore, you actually ought to go out of business. For us, our why is to transform lives. We will not touch any single opportunity that does not clearly define how we can have a transformative impact in the area that we're involved in. And we've said no to a lot of different things because that why is so important to us. This allows you then to set a vision of the picture. Harvard Business Review has a great definition of vision, and they say it's the ideology, what you believe in or care about most, plus a vivid picture of the future. Show people where you're going so they can know whether or not they're making progress towards it. And that creates a common language for the organization, so you start using the same terms over and over again. It's like people come in and one person will use the word strategy, another person will use the strategy, but they are not saying the same thing, even though the word is exactly the same. So after you've set the why, then you have to go show them how. And how is telling people what's expected of them, what's acceptable and not acceptable. It's establishing very clear accountabilities and goals so that people know if they're making progress. What we talk about, we use a system uh, called the Entrepreneurial Operating System in all of our businesses, creating that common language. And what we seek to have is 100% of the right people in the right seats. But what's interesting is that that evolves. You might have the right person in the right seat today, but as your company grows or changes or you start new businesses, they may not be in the right seat any longer. We've had people who were VPs of small organization that as we grew and developed, we actually outgrew them, and they were no longer a VP of a larger organization. That's a tough conversation to have, but it's an important one to have. And finally, you have to break down the future into smaller increments. It's like the Russian nesting doll. You think, how does this little doll get into this big doll? Well, 10 years or 25 years out is too hard for most people to conceptualize and understand how they get from here to there. So we break it down from 25 years to 10 years to three years to one year to the next 90 days. And so that everybody knows for the next 90 days exactly what's expected of them and how they're going to be making progress towards that future. So by having a great climate and culture then, you ultimately affect your talent density of your organization. And that talent density is how many top performers, rock stars do you have in your organization? It allows you to attract and retain better talent to keep them, and then interestingly, one single person who comes in who's a rock star has an incredible compounding effect in your company that ultimately leads to you attracting better talent and to performing that much more. 
So with the time remaining, we're talking about how to foster that great culture. So one, we have to communicate ex uh, expectations extensively. You have to communicate as many as seven times what you want people to understand before they actually get it. In this sense, it's a bit like parenting. You have to say it over and over and over again. And even when people are nodding, they're still not quite getting it. You have to continue to do that. That can be exhausting in leadership because you're saying the same thing. And what's obvious to you is not obvious to everyone else. So you have to communicate those expectations extensively. You have to then communicate what's not acceptable. We actually built a culture map inside of our company that actually showed exactly what our culture is, love, faith, hope, and excellence, and defined those terms down to questions so people understand exactly if they're embodying those things, and then we score them against them. But I also found that we had to, and this was a lesson learned, we actually had to create a set of antithetical behaviors of those things that would not be acceptable in any form, like gossip. We've actually let people go in our company over gossip. We define that as anything negative shared with somebody that can't do anything about it directly. So if you complain about IT to your colleague, that's gossip. That's actually not allowed in our company. And we've actually seen from time to time as our business has evolved and gone up and down is that that can actually, especially in a really good culture where people care deeply about the company, gossip can actually emerge. And it merges unintentionally to begin with, but it can become pervasive and that can actually become a cancer in your organization that begins to erode the very foundation of what you're trying to accomplish. And then you have to conduct real performance reviews against those set standards once you've set the expectations. So that's one, communicate extensively. Two is think holistically. Culture is ultimately embodied in everything that you do. The coffee you serve in your office, the big business negotiation, every single little thing. I love the way that Disney says it. They say that they don't micromanage, but they expect to manage every detail. And I love how they think about that, really breaking it down and thinking holistically about the entire experience. Three, it takes time. It's interesting when I see somebody come in who takes over as an, or an organization that's struggling with culture, and the CEO will come in, and they'll say, we are going to change the culture here. And my first thought is, I hope they have a five to seven year mandate from the board, because it takes a lot of time, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult when you have a great culture to keep it on course, let alone to take a bad culture and begin to turn it around. So it takes time. You have to be patient. You have to be steadfast. And especially in leadership, you have to be very confident that you're heading in the right direction so that you can continue to set the tone for the organization. Being patient also allows you to recruit thoroughly, to really be thorough in your hiring so that you can ultimately attract that right talent and get them in the right place and be patient there. Because remember, your actual culture is going to be shown in who gets rewarded, promoted, and ultimately let go. That's how it's going to be embodied. So, in order to do all that, to wrap it all up, good culture is set in a good climate is a bit like parenting again. You're going to set the parameters, you're going to enforce the rules, and you're going to ensure consistency by giving people a clear picture of why are you doing what you're doing and where's that going, and then show them what the expectations are and the pattern that's going to get there. Those things in with those clear communication of what you value most as an organization, and that can be different in different organizations, is ultimately what attracts those right people to you to get to that culture. So we've seen this play out really well, and although it's June, we're gonna act like it's Christmas. There's a Christmas video here next that we sent out. And what I love about this is that this was actually produced by our team, and I didn't know anything about it until the cards went out, which is a little unusual for me because I'm a bit maniacal about marketing and about making sure that brand consistency happens. But this Christmas video went out, and it shows what happened in 2016 that actually was an output of the culture that we've created.
Thank you. Thank you.